Hello and welcome to the fourth set of slides for the Foundation Licence for the South Knotts Amateur Radio Group. This set of slides are going to describe feeders and antennas. We're going to discuss what a feeder is, antenna connectors, types of antennas, gain and effective radiator power, and matching an SWR. Feeders are used to connect the transmitter and receiver to the antenna. Feeders exhibit loss on transmit and receive. The longer the cable run is, the greater the amount of loss. Loss occurs as some of the RF energy is converted into heat. Feeder loss increases with frequency, so thicker, low loss feeder is required for VHF and UHF because they are a higher frequency and would create more loss. So a lower loss feeder is necessary for those when lower frequencies require uh, less of a low loss cable or a more uh, normal cable. So higher frequency means more loss. A feeder connects the antenna to the transmitter or receiver and there's two ways this is done commonly. The first way is a coaxial cable known as coax. This is widely used by amateurs. It's unbalanced which we'll describe in more detail later. It has an inner conductor and this is what carries the actual signal. It also has an outer braid or screen and this contains the signal within the cable so there's no radiation out of the cable itself. The other method that's used frequently is twin feeder or commonly called ladder line. This is balanced and again we'll describe this in more detail later. It carries equal and opposite signals in the two wires. There's a constant separation between the two wires as well. So looking at the diagram below, you'll notice that on the coaxial cable on the left, you'll see there's several layers. In the centre of the wire, this is the inner conductor, and that's the copper coloured wire that you'll see to the right of both images on the left. And this is what carries the signal. There's then a dielectric, uh, which is usually some sort of plastic, and this just keeps a constant separation between the inner conductor and the outer braid or screen and then there's the outer braid or screen which is either a mesh of wires wound together uh, or it could be a, a thin um, film of metal uh, or it could be both depending on what the application is on the right hand side we have the twin feeder diagram and as you can see it's simply two wires and they're held at a constant separation with plastic. Uh, this plastic here coats each wire to protect it and intermittently has a cross member there which just holds the wire at a constant separation. There are several connectors that are used in amateur radio. Uh, antennas and feeders are connected using various different types. Plugs and sockets for RF should be of the correct type. So if you have a male of one type, it needs to connect to a corresponding female of the same type. There are four main types which appear on the next slides. These are all for use with coaxial cable and the screen of the coaxial cable must be correctly connected to ensure that the RF signals do not get into or out of the cable. There are several larger connectors. The most common type you'll see on the left here is the PL259, PL standing for plug. And this has a screw thread locking mechanism, so it screws on as a connection. And these are common for HF radios. As you can see in the diagram there, 
There's a central uh, conductor sticking out, which connects into the female uh, connector that would correspond with this. And you'll see that main large barrel section is a screw-on fitting. On the right-hand side, we have the N connector, and this is a more up-to-date, higher performance and generally more reliable connector. This is also a screw-on connector, and this is very common for HF all the way through to VHF, UHF and beyond, as it handles higher frequencies with more accuracy and is more reliable with less loss. There are several smaller connectors used as well. On the left here we have the BNC, which is a bayonet connection, and what that means is it's a push on and twist and it locks into place. We use 50 ohm and not the 75 ohm versions. Uh, 50 ohm versions is used exclusively uh, in amateur radio, 75 ohm versions are generally used for TV antennas and there is a, an important difference. As you can see on the diagram to the left there, there's a centre conductor that's just peeking out in gold. And then the outer body, instead of being a screw-on type, is a push and twist connection. On the right-hand side we have the SMA connection, and this is a, again a screw-on connection. Often found on handheld radios, they're very small and compact, so they lend themselves nicely to uh, small radios. And again we have a centre conductor, as you can see, poking out of the middle. And then the outer body, uh, which is the screw-on fitting. Next we're going to discuss antennas. Antennas convert an electrical signal into radio waves and vice versa. So this is the item that takes your signal from the radio and puts it out into the air. And in the other respect, takes a signal out of the air and passes it down to your radio. It's designed for a specific frequency or bunch of frequencies. And the antennas tend to be different sizes for different bands. In general, longer wavelengths or lower frequencies need larger antennas and vice versa. Shorter wavelengths, meaning higher frequencies, need smaller antennas. There are various antenna types which you'll be covering in these trainings and here is a selection uh, that you will need to know about. The first on the left here is the Yagi antenna and as you can see there's usually a boom or, or main supporting stick with several uh, radials or um, effectively mini dipoles uh, sticking out from it and it tends to look uh, very similar to this on all the different makes and models uh, a main stick with uh, pieces of wire sticking out top and bottom or left to right uh, same thing dipole radios in the center at the bottom there are uh, some sort of supporting stick uh, generally and then a cross wire at the top we have a 5 8 wave antenna in the centre at the top there and this usually has some sort of coil at the bottom and then a main antenna running up from that and these will have radials which are the horizontal pieces at the very bottom there. There's also quarter wave antennas to the top right and these tend to uh, also look similar to the 5 8 wave but just without the coil and again they're normally in the form of a white stick with radials at the bottom. A 5 8 wave can also be very similar in appearance but usually with the the coil at the bottom. And finally the bottom right diagram is a long wire and generally this is a suspended wire between two posts or a house and a post um, and these hang across a garden um, in various different configurations. So these are generally pictures that you would see on the exam and you would just have to name which design it is so please commit these to memory. The first one we're going to discuss in detail is the dipole. The dipole is a basic balanced antenna. It's half a wavelength long 
for example, 10 meters long to work on 14 megahertz, which is the 20 meter band. So the 20 meter band, half of that is 10 meters. So a dipole for the 20 meter band would be 10 meters in length. And as you can see there, it's fed with the feeder from the middle and it goes out to the left and to the right and the horizontal pieces of the antenna in length are half of a wavelength for the band that you're wanting to use it on. In terms of the pattern of radiation that a dipole produces, uh, described as a polar pattern, this shows you how the RF signals radiate from the antenna. So if it's fed in the middle, the radiation or the, the bulk of the radiation is from the centre of the aerial with very little coming off the ends. This is an omnidirectional signal so it goes out in all directions and these are generally very good for the home because they will be transmitting and listening in all directions fairly equally uh, so you've got a good chance of hearing somebody and being able to talk back to them without much effort. The quarter wave ground plane antenna. This is a vertically polarised antenna, meaning instead of hanging sideways, it's up and down. They're a quarter wavelength long. So for example, for the two metre band, a quarter of two metres is half a metre or 50 centimetres. So the actual length of the vertical piece would be 50 centimetres long for the 2 metre band. It has four horizontal wires called radials and these form what's described as a ground plane which acts as a mirror for the radio signals to help reflect them outwards. The 5 eighths wave ground plane aerial is very similar to the quarter wave in that it's a vertical antenna but this time it's five-eighths of a wave long and that's counting from the coil upwards. The advantage of five-eighths rather than a quarter wave is that you have better signals directed out towards the horizon. With the quarter wave there is a slight upward angle to the radiation and therefore it can be going over people's heads if they're a long way away. So the 5 8 wave helps squeeze the pattern to be more low angle and therefore it will go further horizontally uh, with a stronger signal than the quartz wave does. The coil is at the base for coax matching which will be described in further detail later. So the coil is there to help match the aerial to the coax. And this is very popular for VHF and UHF mobile. So you'd see aerials of this design on cars uh, driving around on the roof of the car. N-fed aerials. These are a basic long wire antenna. Unlikely to be of the correct length, so needs to be matched. And again, we'll describe that later. But essentially, you hang up as much wire as will fit in your garden and then they are matched to the correct band uh, in a method we'll describe later. Unfortunately, because this is an unmatched design, it is more likely to cause interference, uh, which has the acronym uh, EMC, than other types of aerials. So these can cause problems if you're not careful. Next is the Yagi. And you'll have noticed this design on tops of houses for TV antennas. These are directional antennas and they focus the signal mainly in one direction. It's based on a dipole. As you can see from the diagram at the bottom on the right, the vertical black line is the actual dipole. The green lines are what are called directors and reflectors which help to focus the transmission in a particular direction rather than it going omnidirectionally in every direction.
Here's the polar pattern for a Yagi. And as you can see, instead of having two even bubbles uh, that the normal dipole exhibits, this has squeezed the bubbles to be mainly in one direction. So if you imagine you're holding a balloon, a dipole produces a, a signal strength pattern similar to a, a round balloon. But as you squeeze the balloon, you find that as you squeeze inwards and make it thinner, it will actually squeeze outwards lengthwise and go longer. And that's effectively what a Yagi does. So you can point this as a distance station and all of your energy is going in the right direction rather than in every direction. This enables the Yagi to send the signal further, but also to receive signals that are weak much better than a standard dipole. Next we're going to describe gain and ERP. The Yagi antenna focuses signals in one direction and has a higher gain than other antennas. Antennas have a measurement of gain in decibels, noted as lowercase d capital B, and this is a comparative measurement and they compare it relative to a half wave normal dipole. So when we're describing a Yagi, if it had a gain of 1, what that means is it's got the same pattern as a normal dipole. As the Yagi uh, creates more and more gain by adding more directors and reflectors, the gain increases. The gain in decibels is described as you've seen on the uh, diagram on the left here. So a gain of 3 decibels means it's a multiple of 2. So if we've got a 100 watt radio going out of a dipole and instead of a dipole we put up a Yagi that has a gain of 3 decibels, the receiving station will receive it in a manner that makes it look like we're transmitting 200 watts instead of 100 watts the signal would be twice the strength. Equally, if we had a Yagi that's got a gain of 6 decibels, that would appear to be that we were using 400 watts, because 6 decibels is a multiple of 4. Again, if we increase that again to 9 decibels, it would appear that it's 6 times the power, and Finally, ten, a gain of 10 decibels appears to be a, a gain of 10 times the power. So just to break this down a bit, if you look at the, the scale here, each 3 decibels is a multiple of 2. So 3, 6, 9 goes 2, 4 and uh, 6 there. Um, so it's multiplying by 2 each time. And finally, a multiple of 10 gives you 10 times. Actually, I believe this slide is, slide is wrong here, because a gain of 9 should be times 8. So apologies for this. I believe this is an incorrect um, uh, gain on the uh, diagram here. Each 3 decibels is a multiple of 2. So as you go up 3, 6, 9, it should be 2, 4 and 8. And then a multiple of 10 gives you 10 times the gain. You don't need to be able to work all this out in a, an equation or anything like this. So please don't be afraid of this. All you need to learn is every 3 decibel increase, you multiply the number by 2. So if we have 10 watts and we put it through a Yagi of a gain of 3 decibels, 3 decibels is times 2. So 10 watts times 2 gives you a, a, an appearance of 20 watts. It's like having a 20 watt radio instead of a 10 watt radio. If that 10 watt radio is connected to a Yagi with a gain of 6 dB, it would appear to be a 40 watt transmission. And then at 9, 9 dB, it would appear to be a multiple of 8. A multiple of 8 would appear to be, a, that 10 watt radio would appear to be an 80 watt radio. And finally, 
10 decibels, as you can imagine, 10 times 10 is 100 watts. So if you had a, a Yagi with a gain of 10 decibels, it would give you the ability to use a 10 watt radio and have a similar performance to a 100 watt radio to all the stations that you're pointing the aerial at. Remember, this is a directional aerial. So as you turn it, you're only getting the gain in the direction that it's pointing. In every other direction, it has very meagre performance. This is purely designed as a directional aerial. Effective radiator power. The directional power of an antenna is expressed as ERP, effective radiator power. It is the power applied to the antenna feed point multiplied by the antenna's gain. So I'll just read that again. It's the power applied to the antenna feed point. So what that means is every all the power coming out your radio that goes along the coax and gets right to the aerial. So what, what power is available at that point, right before it enters the aerial. Multiply that by the antenna's gain and that is the effective radiated power. Now why does it describe it as this? Well please bear in mind that if you have a 100 watt radio for example and you run it through a long piece of coax you might find that at the aerial there's not 100 watts there there might only be 50 watts there because the coaxial cable loss is high because it's a long piece of coaxial cable or it's a thin one that's high loss rather than a low loss cable so Again, the effective radiator power is the power that arrives at the aerial multiplied by the gain of the aerial. So an example here is we have a 10 watt radio, a very short piece of coax, so there's no loss in this example. And then we've got a, a Yagi with a three decibel gain. So 10 watts multiplied by three decibels. And remember three decibels is the equivalent of times two. So 10 watts times 2 equals 20 watts effective radiated power. It mentions here, feed a 3 decibel Yagi with 10 watts and 20 watts will radiate in the primary direction. The way to think of this is if you have a torch that focuses light, obviously a torch shines strongly in one direction and very little or nothing in other directions. That's how you have to think of this. You've got a bulb inside that shines light in all directions, but the mirror in the backing of the torch focuses it in one direction. And that's exactly what a Yagi does. So I hope this has made it clear. Please ask any questions of your tutors uh, if you have any questions about this or you'd like further practice or explanation. Next we're going to discuss polarization and generally there's two types of polarization used horizontal and vertical. Yagis can be vertical or horizontally polarized and if you look at the top right hand picture there and in a previous picture you would notice somebody holding a Yagi and you'll notice that the radiators and the directors and reflectors are in the vertical polarization in this picture. They're up and down. But Yagis can be turned sideways to have them horizontal like a TV antenna. And the difference is nothing really other than the transmitting station and the receiving station really need to be in the same orientation to receive and transmit to each other effectively. If they're not in the same orientation you'll have a significant loss of signal received at the other end because of the mismatch. Most VHF and UHF is vertically polarised by convention. There's not a, a physics reason that it has to be that way, but it's convenient. So if you imagine driving along with your car, having an aerial sticking straight up doesn't cause any problems. Having an aerial that's stuck out sideways might hit other cars or pedestrians, so that would be a problem. So generally, for UHF and VHF, which is used primarily uh, mobile, this is the convention. 
Uh, VHF and UHF, the receive and transmit antennas, need to have the same polarisation as I mentioned. It's less of an issue at HF in fact, as polarisation may be changed by the ionosphere. Now, as we've mentioned briefly before, HF signals are transmitted up and they go into the air and they bounce off the ionosphere, which is the layer around the Earth. As it bounces off, it shoots off in all different orientations and directions. So whether you transmit vertically or horizontally doesn't matter so much because after the bounce, that may have changed anyway. So it's less critical at HF because of the ionospheric bounce. But with UHF and VHF, which is generally just line of sight, it's much more critical to get the correct orientation. Next we're going to discuss matching and SWR. Initially we're going to discuss a ballon. And when you connect an unbalanced feeder to a balanced antenna, you need something called a ballon, which is a shortening of the words balanced to unbalanced. An example here it mentions is a, a ballon is required to connect an unbalanced coax to a balanced dipole. Uh, again, we discussed that coax is unbalanced and a dipole is balanced. So a ballon, this in between connecting piece is needed to convert from one to the other so that they match and work properly. If we use twin feed which is balanced to a dipole antenna which is also balanced it can be a direct connection because no conversion is required. Likewise unbalanced coax to an unbalanced quarter wave aerial again doesn't need any conversion because they match each other and therefore no ballon is required. You don't need to know how a ballon works at this point or what's involved but there's a picture of one there and generally it's a, a, a toroidal ring with a wire wrapped around in a certain pattern to enable the conversion. But don't worry about that for now, that's not critical. All you need to know is that it's needed to convert balanced to unbalanced or unbalanced to balanced. Feed point. The connection point of the feeder to the antenna is called the feed point. Antennas are designed for specific frequencies, the feed point impedance that should match both the feeder and the transmitter. The impedance of an antenna at the feed point is related to the dimensions of the antenna and the wavelength of the applied signal. So what this is saying is at that point between the two items there's a certain impedance or imagine that as a, a resistance if you like, an electrical resistance. and there needs to be a matching of the feeder to the antenna at that feed point. SWR. If the impedance of the antenna does not match that of the feeder, energy, or, or more precisely standing waves, will be reflected back down the feeder. The worse the match, the more energy that gets reflected back. So Regarding the feed point, if that connection is wrong, meaning there isn't an easy flow of energy through that feed point, a bit like waves hitting a beach, some of it will bounce and reflect back. So instead of your signal going out through the aerial, part of it will go out, the other part will head back towards the receiver, having been reflected off of this resistance or impedance. To measure this, we have something called an SWR meter, standing wave ratio meter. This will indicate whether you have the correct match or there is a mismatch. It will also tell you how great of a mismatch there is. The SWR meter measures the flow of power back from the antenna. And a ratio of 1 to 1 
is a perfect match. What that means is a certain amount of energy has gone out and nothing has come back. This scale, this ratio, involves a certain calculation. So to give you a feel of the amount of power being reflected, an SWR ratio of 2 to 1 means that 10% of your power is being reflected back. So it doesn't mean double or half or anything like that. What it means is 10% is being reflected back. And this is generally an acceptable amount for most radios. High SWR at the transmitter, meaning much greater than 2 to 1, indicates a feeder or antenna mismatch which may damage the transmitter. So if it's 3 to 1 or above, it can cause problems. The gauge on SWR meters uh, from the inset picture you see here sometimes has a digital readout and sometimes has some sort of swinging arm mechanism. And this swinging arm mechanism you see here shows two uh, little arms and they both swing up together and where they cross will correspond to one of the red lines which indicates the SWR ratio. So if those two lines move up and cross on the two line, the red line uh, just to the right of the centre, that means the SWR is 2 to 1. Obviously the further over to the right they cross, the worse the SWR is. The further over to the left, uh, sorry, to the right they cross, the better it is. To the left is worse. Matching. Each band ideally requires a different length antenna. If the antenna is the correct length for the band, there is a match. If not, you need to use an antenna matching unit to match them. This is commonly called an ATU, which is an antenna tuning unit, which is a bit of a misnomer because the antenna matching unit matches the impedance, it doesn't tune the aerial or anything like that, so please try not to use that. Antenna matching unit is a better description of what it does, and it will steer you clear of any uh, misunderstandings about tuning. These can correct a mismatch, ensuring no damage to the transmitter. It does not tune the aerial, as I mentioned, therefore you cannot get a bad aerial and make it better with a, an a antenna matching unit, you can only avoid damage to the radio by matching it. The antenna matching unit is commonly used when you're using one large antenna and you are wanting it to work on several bands. And the antenna matching unit is going to absorb the mismatch and allow it to be used on different bands, albeit at a, a compromise in performance but for the convenience of just having one aerial rather than multiple aerials strung around the garden. Next we're going to introduce something called a dummy load. This is a screened resistor and this will be rated for a certain power and a certain impedance. So for our hobby we would want a 50 ohm impedance and then the power needs to be in excess of what you want to use it for. So if you're using it for a 10 watt radio, you need a rating in excess of 10 watts. A 100 watt radio would need one in excess of 100 watts, etc. And these can go up to 1500 watts in value for a large one. These are great for testing when you don't want to transmit on the air. You want to test equipment while you're transmitting, but you don't want to interfere with anyone. And it keeps the radio safe in case you transmit by accident. This will absorb the energy rather than cause the radio to overheat because it's not connected to an aerial, for example. So in summary, we've discussed feeder types. We've discussed unbalanced coax and balanced ladder line. We've looked at several connector types that will be needed uh, for the exam. We've looked at antenna types being the dipole, the quarter wave, the 5 eighths wave, the Yagi and NFED. We've also discussed antenna matching units to match antennas to the correct band. 
polarization being horizontal versus vertical, standing wave ratios, effective radiated power, which again is the transmitted power at the feed point multiplied by the antenna gain. And we've discussed balance to match balanced to unbalanced. If you have any questions or worries or you'd like to discuss further, then please see your tutor and get all your questions answered.